Hi, my name is Michael. I'm going to take you through some Qigong exercises. We've, we're going to continue with the set of exercises we've been doing in the last two episodes. We've done the first six and we shall get through to the ninth, but we'll do a quick warm up first. So, as always, we check our stance, have your feet parallel and hip width apart. So, you don't want to be too wide and too narrow is not good either. So, you want your hips, your knees and your feet to be in line and your shoulders rest above the hips. So, as somebody said to me quite recently, uh, it's like having a, there's a little puff of air underneath the armpits. I think it's a good way of describing it. So you always have a slight openness in the arms. So, if we settle and try and let the spine start to relax. So if you think about the tailbone, and let go of the muscles all around the tailbone and let your spine just start to, to reach towards the floor. But your neck is being raised and goes towards the ceiling. Try not to lift the chin. So you raise the neck so the chin will come in slightly. If I exaggerate it, I'd be doing that. But I don't want to see anyone doing this. You want to raise the neck up towards the ceiling and drop the tailbone towards the floor. So just breathe, and relax. Try and find any of those muscles that are, are still holding on and just soften them. So relax the knees, relax the thighs, relax the ankles. And just breathe. Good. So, big breath in. Breathe, open up the arms. And breathe out. As you just scan through your body, all the way down to the feet. So, big breath in. And breathing out, just work your way, put your mind into the body and it's almost like your, your mind travels down through the body and just try and relax everything as you do. So big breath in and relax everything down, down, through the torso, through the hips, into the feet and away. We just continue on. So you want to work the movement with the breathing. As you breathe, you move. And as you move, you breathe. And we come down. And come up. And down. So you can kind of sink and bring the arms up. And then sink again from the shoulder, comes down, then the elbow, then the wrist. So bring the shoulders down, then the elbows, and then the wrists. So just starting to engage the arms, starting to engage the shoulders. Press into the floor with your feet to rise up and sink into the floor to come down. The next exercise, we're going to take a wider stance. So go to where it's comfortable and try to keep the knees bent. And we're going to rise both arms up. We're going to turn towards your left arm and twist the arm so the palm comes up and the back hand twists round. So the palm goes up the other way. So you're twisting around and then untwist and come back to center. So shift the weight slightly into one leg, raise the palm up and then turn the, the arm that's behind, turn that over. So we go from side to side. Try to keep upright. It's okay if you reach a wee bit, but try to keep upright. And try and get the action to come in the shoulders. 
So it's the shoulder that actually turns. Uh, you don't just turn the wrists. Try and turn the elbows and the shoulders. So you shift onto one side, palm up in front, palm up the other way behind, shift back to the centre, both palms down, shift your weight into the other leg, that palm goes up, this palm rises up the other way, and we come back to centre. So try and extend through if you pick the middle finger, try and extend through the middle finger. It's like you're almost touching the two walls either side of you. And do one more each side. And then come back. Good. So if we just relax with the hands in front and just raise the hands up and then down. Hands up to the side and down. So up in the front and down. Palms up each side and down. So we're going to continue this downward motion and bring the middle fingers together so the backs of the hands touch the wrists and then the elbows. We extend up, open the hands out and just continue with a big circle around. You can sink, gather, rise and separate. So we sink down Gather in, rise up, and separate out. So just breathe whatever way you want to. If breathing in on the way up is good for you, that's what you do. Just keep breathing. So you want to sink down and use the legs to push you back up. So keep the spine straight, think about the tailbone, drop the tailbone down. And rise up, separate. Try not to bring the shoulders all the way up to your ears, keep the shoulders quite down. So your collarbones should stay still, but the shoulders move. Okay, we'll do one more. And relax. Okay, so we'll continue on with the Jin Jing, the longer version that we have. So, as we've done this before, we rise up, the thumb line comes up into the shoulder, I want to raise up and then come into the chest. So we come in towards the heart. You breathe and expand the lungs and breathe out and relax. So when we breathe in this time, the elbows come up. We reach forward, out to the side and then sink the wrists. Sink the tailbone slightly as well. So you should still feel that extension of the spine. So the neck is still attached to the ceiling and the, the tailbone drops towards the floor. So try and relax the shoulders. Try and feel like there's an expansion. Your body is opening. 
So don't just stand there holding your arms, trying to feel like there is an expand. You, you, you expand out both sides. And relax. So the fingers start pointing forwards. They come in towards the chest. Turn the palms up. And then we reach with the wrists and raise the heels. We make fists, drop the heels down, try to keep the neck raised. We come down to here. Left hand goes behind the back and the right hand comes towards the left hip. Then you unravel up over the right shoulder. Stay looking at the palm. And then open out, change sides. So your left hand comes towards your right hip and your right hand goes behind the back. Raise the left hand above the shoulder. And back. The next one, we step back with the right foot. We bring the left fist in and the right fist up the spine. And then we extend forwards. Left hand forward, left leg forward. We bring the fist in in front of the shoulder. And the right fist goes up the spine. And we turn the body to the side and then extend forwards again. Pull in and twist. Push out and stretch. Bring the, the foot in, back to parallel, both hands out to the side. Step back with the left, the right hand comes out in front. Again, pull the right fist towards the shoulder and the left fist goes up the spine. Turn the body as you do and then stretch forward. Pull the body back and reach forward. Do one more, and reach forward, and back to a neutral position. Here, we want to bring the hands forward. Keep the fingers pointing forward as the elbows come out, and we relax down into this position. Open, stretch. Push into the back as you press forward. Really expand the fingers. Relax the hands and come back to in front of the heart. So we expand out, stretch forward. Really stretch open the fingers and the arms and then relax and back to here. Here we're going to turn and hold a ball. So just turn to your right slightly. Hold the ball in front of your chest. The right hand tucks down and goes out to the back and the left hand goes forward. We turn the body back to the center. The right hand goes behind the head and the left hand again reaches up the spine. So you want to reach the fingers up as far as you can up the back. We Turn, so you, you want to look at your right elbow and past your right elbow. So you look up, twist the back as much as you can. Do it nice and safely though. Right? Then we uncurl and twist forward, down towards the left hip. You should be able to see behind you. We reach up, try to not hold on to the head too much, but we want to pull the elbows backwards to open up the ribs as well as stretch the back. And then come forwards, tuck down. Try not to pull on the neck, but just curve the spine around to the side so you should be able to see behind you. It's okay if you only get to there, that's fine. But if you can, 
reach around a little bit more. Come up. And down. And back to center. Open both hands out. This time the left hand goes behind the head and the right hand fingers make their way up the spine to wherever's comfortable. We turn towards our left elbow and pull both elbows back. And then we curve the spine and down. And back up. Down. And last time. And down. Okay. Open both hands out. Take another wide stance. This time we're going to lower the body down, keep the spine straight. So we lower the tailbone down, turn the palms up and rise up. So just a little one at first. Rotate the shoulders, palms down. Go down a little bit further. Turn the palms up and rise. And then sink down. Just go to wherever is comfortable, wherever you can. Try to sink down, keep the spine straight. Try not to lean and back up. So once more, down a little bit. Rise up. Down a bit more. And rise up. Down as far as you can, but keep it safe. Keep, keep your, your knees safe. So if you feel any problems in the knees, just don't, don't do this and just slowly come out of it. Good. And we bring the feet in close together. We bring the hands down into the hips, make nice loose fists. We turn to the side, bring the hand across to the shoulder and then we drop it down the side of the body. So go down the edge. If you have a seam on your trousers, try and follow the seam down. We wipe across in front of the feet to the other side, make a fist, and bring the little finger comes up the side, back to the starting point. So open the palm out, watch as it comes across the body, watch the hand as it comes down, across the feet, make a fist, and come up. Right side, cross to the left shoulder, come down. If you need to bend your knees, that's fine. You don't have to keep your legs straight. If you want to bend your knees and bring it all the way down there, that's fine. If you want to keep your legs straight, you can also wipe along there if you want. So you come down to, you want to push yourself a little bit, but don't, don't over, overdo this at all. One more each side. So raise the, the palm, come across to the side of the body, down, go across in front of the toes, make a fist, and come up. Other side. Return to normal stance. So, thank you very much for uh, watching this video. My name is Michael. You can find me at Indoor Tiger Qigong on Facebook or go through Yellow Cream Tai Chi. And um, we've got a website, Facebook, anything you want there. Um, thanks very much to Accidental Theatre for, for making all this happen. It's very kind of them. Great bunch of guys. And I'll see you next time.
Goodbye.
welcome to Talk IT. Uh, for this week, we are going to welcome in the fantastic Caelan Carey Thompson from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, as well as Brona McFeely from the Lyric Theatre. Uh, we're going to kind of just run straight into the programme this week, but um, I will introduce our, our panel of heads first, to, uh, first and foremost. So at the top, uh, we have Niall and Louise. Then we have uh, t uh, Marty and uh, Tommy in the middle, and then Brona and Caelan at the, at the bottom. Them. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us uh, today. Woo! <laughs> uh, we've got to run in quickly because Caelan doesn't have a, a huge amount of time because the Arts Council is quite busy at the moment. So uh, welcome, Caelan. Thank you so much for coming on uh, to have a chat with us. Um, we're specifically kind of looking with you today about the, uh, the Arts Council's current response to the COVID-19 uh, epidemic or pandemic now, as I suppose it is. Uh, and what the drama and dance uh, uh, help and support for individual artists there is. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little about what, uh, what's happening? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I'm the drama and dance officer with the Arts Council of Northern Ireland. And as soon as COVID-19 sort of struck and the scale of the pandemic was apparent, um, really the first thing that the Arts Council did was rallied around to um, divert our funds, so the money that we already have in the Arts Council coffers, uh, towards an emergency programme called the Artists' Emergency Programme. Um, so this is a rolling programme that opened last week and the overall pot is half a million, which is fantastic and sounds like a lot of money because it is, um, until you consider the scale of what we're facing and um, the scale, the size of our amazing performing arts sector here in Northern Ireland. So the scheme is open at the minute. As I say, it's rolling, so there's no deadline. It's a quick turnaround. So um, when you submit your application, you'll get... Um, word back and the assessment and hopefully the answer that you want within two weeks um, and each um, applicant can apply for a grant of up to five thousand pounds so it is really kind of um, generous and designed with the individuals in mind so people who are eligible for this scheme are basically anyone who makes their living working in the live art scene around here. I'm talking specifically from a drama and dance perspective so if your bread and butter is um, employed on an independent, most likely, basis, um, working towards the creation of live performance, then you're eligible. So it covers the kind of usual suspects, people you would expect, actors, directors, uh, dancers, choreographers, so on and so forth, playwrights. Um, but also it um, broadens out to the people who may be less visible or um, you wouldn't necessarily think of unless you actually knew how, how the performing arts work. So all of your backstage crew, all design, AV, costume set, lighting, um, so on and so forth. Um, sound, composition, choreography, uh, stage management, all of that, all your LX and sound operators and so on. Um, the process itself, we kind of we recognise that these are the people. These are kind of our frontline workers who deliver the goods. You know, without your stage manager, your performer, your director, we don't have any theatre. Um, but we also recognise that these aren't the people who are accustomed to filling out these kind of bulky uh, bureaucratic forms. So I would really encourage everyone to kind of reach out to me through my email um, at the Arts Council or Neve Orla at Theatre and Dance NI who are brilliant to give you a wee bit of help if you're just finding it kind of debilitating. Um, you, honest to goodness, you will not be um, viewed upon or assessed for your form filling out capacity or kind of your, um, you know, uh, the lyricism of your prose or anything like that. That's not the point. Um, we just want you to tell us in a straightforward, non-fussy way as possible, exactly what the situation has meant for you and your livelihood. Um, so the form is meant to be li uh, light touch, just stick down bullet points and lists of, of the impact. Um, if I can just maybe talk a wee bit about the form, because I think that is the kind of major barrier. Um, it talks in terms of a project that you have to propose. Um, and really, this is because the Arts Council is an arts funding organisation. So our raison d'etre is to give money towards the creation of art. Um, however, we're aware at this stage 
in this kind of emergency crisis moment that's not as straightforward and not as clean cut as one might expect in ordinary times so a project is not necessarily a fully figured out deliverable idea of you know a script or a um a theme and a practice and a choreographic process that you're going to engage in it can really be time for you to say look ordinarily i'm a creative person but right now i need to take this time to think about how my practice and my profession is going to look at the end of it so you can just tell me what you'll be spending your time doing and um, engaging for instance with networking with reaching out to other people maybe a bit of um, upskilling and training maybe a bit of exploring online uh, presentations whatever that's entirely up to you but you don't need to absolutely promise and define precisely what you are going to be able to hand over to us in six months time that's not the point it's really more fun to keep people body and soul together and to keep you kind of engaged in your in your practice and your um development so when it comes to kind of breaking down in a budget because i know that's also something that um, when you have the likes of Brona, who's more than capable of dealing with broad, uh, budgets and so on, the rest of us kind of run scared, thinking that's not my domain. Um, it's really just telling us what the money will go towards. So it can you can just break it down in terms of lost income. So if you lost a couple of gigs that you were meant to do, stick that down. Or if it's that you just want to pay yourself a living wage for like two months, stick that down. Or you can put down, you know, your rent and subsistence just to cover those costs. We're not going to be overly scrutinizing or interrogating these things. It really, just as the process is meant to be quite easy and light touch, the assessment is the same. We're going to look and say, are you a practicing uh, arts professional, creative, artistic, professional in whatever capacity? Yes, you are. Have you been hit by COVID-19? Well, if you're working in the live arts, of course you have been. So are you going to spend this time maintaining your kind of engagement with your practice yes you are then here's the money that's really <laughs> straightforward as it is um it's open already and as you would imagine it's already really subscribed and particularly within our field which is a good thing in that at least people are recognizing that this is for them and they qualify and uh people are submitting um but please please just keep them coming in um, they shouldn't be too onerous to fill in. You should be able to do it quite quickly. And we want the whole representation. We want producers. We want AV designers, stage managers, crew, all of those people. We want your applications in because we know unless we kind of maintain you in this realm at the other end of this, we may have some great scripts and some great directors and performers waiting around, but <laughs> nobody's going to be able to put the show on unless we still have our full creative team. There you go. Yeah. Thank you so much. That that's fantastic to hear. I mean, I think one of the fears we've we've been hearing is that because it's oversubscribed, I mean, people don't quite understand, I suppose, how the application is being assessed. Uh, mm -hmm. With that level of, you know, one of the worries is that you know, with that level of money and with maximum grants of five thousand, that only means one hundred people might get it. Uh, mm -hmm. Is 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 that a reality, or is is it is it much more nuanced than that? No, it's much more nuanced as you would. Um you would like to think anyway the reason that it's kind of oversubscribed already is it's worth pointing out this isn't just a pot for drama and dance this is across all our art forms so from traditional arts to craft visual art music literature participatory all of them can apply i would imagine that our sector should be more heavily represented than others because i think it's more clear cut just how devastating the um the shutting down of venue somewhere like the Eric that didn't go dark during the troubles, like the first time in its life, it's had to close the doors. It was absolutely massive for um, our sector. Um, so the reason it's kind of um, over or well, well subscribed at this um, point is that it's the whole arts community are coming into it. Um, of course, like that simple arithmetic to say 500,000 great that means there'll be 100 lucky applicants um but it doesn't like we are cognizant of that and doing everything we can to kind of spread it out as much as possible so i've just done my first round of assessments but half an hour ago finished them and you know there are some recommendations for five thousand um but likewise we're kind of thinking what is a good lump of money to put in people's hand right now and keep them going so there will be some particularly if like um particularly vulnerable or frontline 
uh, kind of things or projects that might involve different creatives so you're spreading the money around a wee bit more but realistically we don't want to be given just little piecemeal bits we want to be you know you want a letter coming through that says x number of thousands so it actually makes a difference so that is our intention at the minute we're trying to give a good lump sum to the successful candidates but enough that it's so you're kind of mid thousands not not too many up at the five thousand end but if you're going to get something it's not going to be 200 quid like it's going to be kind of four figures that's brilliant now uh, we had a couple of comments come in or questions come in uh, before we started the show yes this is for keelan um it's from sean o'conlon and he teaches performing arts at saint kevin's college in county fermanagh Mm -hmm. and or rather it's from his students and they're asking um what opportunities are there for them in terms of performing arts once they qualify from university how can the arts council support them um well once they that's kind of key saying once they qualify or have trained because the arts council funding we don't actually have any schemes that cover training or education per se um but we do have an entire stream which some people might be familiar with um which is quite annoyingly shortened to saya saya this saya that so that's support for the individual artist program so once these young people um emerge and start really to figure out their practice so you need to kind of engage with the art scene so this was from anna you were saying mm -hmm. so find out what activities there are find out what um what kind of broader art sector there is i know kind of one of our prominent um organizations within this field is dylan quinn dance theater down from anna which is astounding like top-notch choreographer and dance artist and he does a lot of kind of community and participatory work so for anyone um with a particular interest in physicality and movement and dance th that would be an obvious outlet so once they kind of engage with their art form and practice and start to figure out where they're going, I would say the thing to look at is the SIAP. You do need to be a few years on the road engaging with the with the sector before you can apply. But that offers in the general awards, it offers awards of up to three thousand pounds to really just develop yourself and your skills. So you could apply for, you know, um money to for instance purchase books or dvds or online tutorials or to um although we don't cover training you can um arrange for things called self-arranged residencies would which would extend to for instance arvon uh writing courses or residential writing courses um which get a lot of in england that won't be happening this year because nobody will be traveling or residing other, anywhere other than their house but there are schemes like that and i would say don't rush it like i know i certainly suffered um in my career much as it is um of sort of saying well what can i do and what will people kind of not think is too pushy or whatever um and i don't think there's a there's a massive onus and finding your niche right away. These things are all fluid and they can work through, you know, design, stage management, directing ensemble work. They can put together their own kind of uh, set of peers and, um, and kind of ensembles to work on together. So I'd sort of say, find your own feet. It takes, a, it takes an awful long time to do that and to find your voice. Um, and once you're getting there and you kind of know if it's going to be, you know, like non-verbal, experimental, um, traditional storytelling, whatever it is, when you find that, then you'll be able to apply in a more kind of directed, focused way for funding from us. Thank you so That's much. brilliant. Thank you, Keelan. Uh, Louise, before, sorry to put you on the spot, Louise, uh, yeah. but before the before we started, you were actually looking at the application process and you had yeah. a wee question as well. Which question was that again? <laughs> <laughs> um, because well, of the nature of it being a project, you were kind of, you, you weren't too sure, you work in street theatre specifically, uh, and uh, you weren't too sure kind of how to frame the project element and then Keelan's kind of covered it slightly the idea it doesn't have to be a project but um is that does that answer what you were kind of talking about before yeah well I had kind of I had been on the meeting that was yesterday and it was fantastic um Keelan and the theatre and arts who just amalgamated they had done yesterday and, and that actually answered a lot of the questions was whereas I was sitting there thinking right come up with a really intelligent amazing project 
and like coming out like absolutely blue sky thinking ridiculousness and as Keelan had said yesterday it's all about it's more about am I getting this right Keelan whenever it's more about keeping us artists in the running and not sending us off back to finance or back to wherever we were before and keeping us as artists that are active within the community absolutely and like taking off that very natural pressure of oh my god there's a cri- there's a crisis well you creative people will know how to deal with this and respond yeah. never mind that you can't put bread on the table or know if you're ever go- going to have your normal means of employment again like this is just buying you time um i wouldn't expect for the life of me someone to come up with the greatest idea ever in these circumstances you're saving up a hand. Cataclysmic <laughs> world event when we don't know what's happening. This is not the time um, to sit back and, you know, twiddle your moustache and think, yeah, this is my idea. Um, your project in terms of this um, fund and application can be the general area in which you will kind of invest your time and reflect and explore. So yours can be just um, framed around your practice of street performance and say you're looking at that. If you have a seed of an idea, fine. But also if you want to just be thinking about where that practice um, will go and its place within the landscape once the sort of lockdown eases a bit. Like those are really big questions and it's quite enough to kind of buy yourself a couple of months to think about that rather than coming up with a new thing. The other thing that I really took from yesterday, which was really, really helpful was that for this really and truly what I've what I've what I've read into it, and you can tell me if this is right, that the project in this particular fund is us as ourselves as artists, and it's about putting towards us. But the other thing is the other fund and application for the SIAP award is still available to us, even if we did get this or if we don't get this, we're still open to the SIAP award as well. Is that correct? Totally, totally bang on, Louise. Um, and that's right. I think the word project, like we all have a vision of what it means, like right back from school or activities or whatever. But this is kind of like I was saying yesterday, it's like a broad net over all of the art forms as well. So our project in drama and dance will be very different to a sculptor or, you know, a, a poet or whatever. Mm-hmm. So as you that is beautifully put, Louise, like your project can be yourself. Your project is your own practice or profession. And like Gina Donnelly, one of our stage managers, was asking yesterday, what how is a stage manager meant to frame that? Which is totally like viable question but we also know that stage managers are are really kind of skilled professionals who have to constantly reflect and keep up with their practice and we also know the kind of input that they give on the ground for the creation of work so them continuing to engage with just reading about networking or finding kind of forums because all the european and international um, and UK wide and Ireland, just to be diplomatic, it's true. Mm. Uh, networks and forums are all kind of going online and, and addressing these kind of immediate issues. So those sorts of things are totally fine to apply for as well. And good point to bring up about the SIAP as well, Louise, because usually that support for the individual artist programme, um, it's an annual uh, programme which usually opens in the summer and closes sort of around September um, when the assessments happen. And usually there are kind of um, strict rules about you don't get them in consecutive years and, and so on. Whereas this year, all of that has been has gone out the window and we're just saying we're going to move the the um, window for applic- two windows in this, sorry. Um, we're going to uh, move the kind of opening time frame, if you will, of the application forward. And um, so that will be opening in the coming weeks or months rather than further on down the line. And even if you currently have a SIAP from uh, 2019 to 20, you can still apply this year. Uh, Also, if you apply to the Artists Emergency Programme and are successful, you can still apply to this year's support for the Individual Artists Programme as well. So hopefully with that, people will be able to get a kind of you know, a bit of a patchwork of support. And there'd be a bit more time to think possibly about the project or what you want to to really invest because the SIAP can run over a full calendar year. So that gives you a bit more of a time to think about about what your project will be in those terms. But that'll be coming up kind of weeks and months possibly. So certainly the Arts Council will be putting that out through all the usual uh, ways and means and Theatre and Dance and I will be keeping everybody posted. The other thing is next week, a similar programme to this one 
the individual emergency programme is opening for small to medium sized organisations. So that opens on Monday and that's up to 25k per organisation. And the thing with that is that's kind of trying to get back to more of our um, natural economy and ecosystem where if the money goes in at the top to those structures then once programming and activities begin our freelancers and independent creatives and artists get employment and the money starts to trickle down so hopefully once once we have that injection of money and we begin to see the the end of the lockdown hopefully there'll be more opportunities for um employment in your normal kind of professional and creative practice coming back into play. That's, That's brilliant. Plan. Thank you very much, Caelan. Um, well, I'll, I'll ask you one last thing about with, with applications, usually the fear is that you have to be quite detailed. It feels like, as you say, the, the, the light touch that's needed with this. What would, be, what would you advise people within when they're kind of breaking down their budgets? You know, should they break it down by the hundred, break, break it down by the thousand with the kind of description of the project? For inverted commas, yeah. um, you know what? What kind of is it? Bullet points that you're looking for? How how light a touch is it versus kind of level of detail? What should people kind of balance it with? Yeah. Um, I think it definitely is. We're heading down the bullet point, the kind of technical writing rather than you know wild flourishes. Um, so just state things, boom, 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 so that if you were to lift up the sheet, like you could almost just absorb it on on first view, and rather than having to make your way. Um, through it all but also I would say even if you're being kind of succinct and just putting your bullet points or your list of things in certainly be succinct and pragmatic like that but also don't overlook some of the stuff that you've done like there's no um, assuming that my mushy brain will remember every show that everyone has been in you know just stick everything down and if it needs some clarification put that in, put things in brackets. And I was saying yesterday, because it's such a concern um, within theatre and dance, particularly, I think, is this kind of um, terrible modesty, like lovely, but terrible modesty mm. that people have that to say, oh, well, I collaborated with this, with this creation, or I do have this working relationship with this company, that that somehow is kind of being too big for your boots or something. No, it's not. This is... You know, if you were an electrician or an accountant or whatever, you would say what your job entails. Just tell me what it is that you do in the working relationships that you have. Um, so yes, make sure you put everything in, but just put it in a kind of accessible, easy to basically treat me um, as the idiot that I am and just make it really, really accessible. Just, you know, say here, boom, boom, boom are the things that I do. These, make sure you put in about how the crisis has affected you because that's a big kind of from that we can see who really really needs it and how much work has been impacted because we know it's hard enough to kind of plan a career and finances month to month year by year so we need to see if you had the promise of work and then it's just evaporated and um, so make sure that that you fill that section out I would say when it comes to the budget that you were saying Richard it's really up to everyone I wouldn't get into pounds and pence like keep it in bold figures but sort of you know um a good kind of yardstick to go by is the ITC rates so whatever your creative discipline is if you go to ITC or your equity rates but likewise rather than putting in 487 pounds a week or something stick down 500 is fine you know like it doesn't have to be um like these are all kind of general figures because it is emergency and speculative in what we're doing. So just keep it to like the tens and hundreds, the hundreds really rather than the tens. That's great. Thank you so much, Killian. I'm very aware that you're, you're really busy and we've kind of doubled the amount of time we said we would take up. So thank you so much. Um, I am going to kind of signpost to Theatre and Dance and I, who did a fantastic session with Killian yesterday. Uh, it was about 80, or about, I think 70 to 80 people on it uh, asking questions and getting feedback on the forum. They are posting that as a video, I think, soon if they haven't already. Um, it'll probably be on, because Theatre and Dance and I have just merged, probably be on Theatre and I or DRB's 
respective platforms. So check on those. Or as uh, uh, Keelan said, uh, give Orla at DRB, uh, formerly DRB, a wee shout. She's still using the previous email address because they have literally just merged and still making email addresses. Um, thank you so much, uh, Keelan. We're going to throw it to Dan Leith, who's been making uh, videos from his home. Uh, so uh, we're going to come back uh, after Dan's video with Brona from the Lyric. But first of all, here is uh, Dan with reviews in a rabbit onesie. Hello, and welcome to Reviews in a Rabbit Onesie, the show in which I, Dan Leith, review things in a rabbit onesie. Still don't, still don't have a theme tune, still don't, still don't have a theme tune, still don't, still don't have a theme tune. That's the theme from Jaws. Because that's right. In this episode, I'm reviewing two movies about sh sharks. Of course, because this, that's Benchley, he's my shark. Bringing us to movie number one. Jaws, 1975. Fucking stellar film from Steven Spielberg. What can you say about Jaws? First of all, the music, John Williams, genius. I mean, the man has composed so many fucking fantastic theme tunes. And in this example, he knew less was more. Boom, 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 boom. The plot of this movie is about a killer shark, a great white that terrorizes a small island community that uh, live off them summer dollars. Stars Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus. Incredible casting. Starts super strong. Obviously, you've got the music, 70s haircuts. You've got nude swimming. She She's naked. It's actually quite relevant to now because the mayor of the island just doesn't want to shut shit down even though he's been told there's been a shark attack. He's just like, oh fuck it, it's a summer time, we need summer dollars. He's a bit of a cunt. He doesn't want to close the beaches like people didn't want to close the bars. But let me tell you that if I can't have a pint of fucking Guinness right now, then people, people shouldn't be able to swim in this film. There's a woman who loses her son, Kittner. She confronts Brody about the fact that he knew there was a shark attack and he let people go to the beaches anyway. And it's such a brilliant moment because in a lot of films nowadays, like people are just collateral damage. But like you really feel her grief in this moment. Still my boy is dead now. So fucking good. Amazing shots. Spielberg, top of his game. Like a lot of zooming, dramatic zooming. It's hard to recreate on this. I mean, it's still so exciting and tense and scary. The scene where Richard Dreyfus does a night dive, inspecting an abandoned boat, and there's a big bite mark in it. I don't know. Ah! It's still really scary. Such a quotable film. He is to swimming with bow-legged women. It's very well in Spanish ladies are old. One of my favorite movie scenes ever. That USS Indianapolis speech. <laughs> I don't actually know if there's a better monologue in a film ever. Robert Shaw nailing it. The change between levity to seriousness and back to levity. I'm tired, I don't wanna go to bed. I don't drink about an hour ago. What I learned from this movie is that cutting open sharks is a very smelly business and people just don't wanna shut things down despite there being a major threat relevant you're you're gonna need a bigger boat it's a timeless classic it's actually an example of of a film being better than the book the book was a little bit racist uh, a bit smutty the film is just better five out of five sharks smile you son of a bitch It's not really fair to compare any movie to Jaws, uh, but I've done it anyway. Movie number two, Surrounded, also known as Frenzy in the States. If you seen this movie, then don't. The plot of this film is essentially that a bunch of hateful vloggers, for some reason, are on a secret vlogging mission. So they're going to a cove in, in a plane. The plane breaks down because it's made of bad CGI polystyrene. Plane crashes and then three sharks come at them. To say that this movie is terrible is an understatement. It's about vloggers, for one. Broken physics, illogical decisions, bollocks. Even at the start of the film, after the plane crash, they find a dinghy. And then the boyfriend of, of the protagonist, Lindsay, tries to swim... 
to the cove. Why not take the dinghy? He gets eaten, and Lindsay just kind of screams in the water. Like, ah! Doesn't try to swim or, or get away. Anyway, after that, it gets even more logical because she outswims three great white sharks. Sharks are right on her, and then they're far away again, right on her, far away. The way this is edited is a fucking nightmare. She just kind of like times a, a, a dive out of the way while a shark just goes... <laughs> It's fucking bollocks. I, I actually don't care if I spoil this movie for you because you should just nev never watch it. You've got like an ex-marine character who does her own USS Indianapolis story. A, nobody cares. And B, now is not the time. Essentially this film has a lot of moments where sharks swim full speed at boats and dinghies. Barely graze them and then the actors just like throw themselves in, in, into the water. Um, it's dreadful. I was on the shark side uh, because I hated the protagonists, all of the actors. And then I was annoyed with the sharks because they were completely inept at biting a dinghy or just killing people who re you could easily kill. And then I was just annoyed that sharks in the real world hadn't gained the ability to grow legs and go down to uh, the sci-fi movie studios and just tear to pieces anyone involved with the production of this movie. I mean, the, the protagonist gets very protective over corpses of people. I, I don't I don't know why. She talks to the sharks a lot. She even ends up goading them. I scared them away. I scared them away. Yes, she did with your fucking terrible acting. Take a moment to vlog about it. That'll, that'll really help the situation. It's just inconsistent. There's moments where you're panicking because you're in the water with sharks. And then there's moments where you spend five minutes talking to someone and then go, oh, by the way, there's sharks in the water. They rig up some sort of, like, boulder on a rope thing. Like, it's fucking Wiley Coyote. This isn't Space Jam. It actually fucking works and kills one of the sharks. Rope and plastic boulder? What the fuck? Two lads show up on a boat saving the day. That's a highlight because, like, once again, the shark just, like, nudges the boat and one of the guys throws himself in. The other one's like, take my hand! And the shark's like, ah, fucking stupid. It does have a couple of hardcore moments. A girl jumps at a shark and starts stabbing it in, in the face. Fair fox. Character uses a cylinder of compressed air and just, like, fucking shoots it through a shark's skull. So it does one up. Jaws in that sense, but also in no other sense because it's fucking terrible. It also has the shortest credits I have ever seen in my life, and I think that's because everyone took their name off the project. Things I learned from this movie. Sharks hunt in packs. If someone has a broken leg, you can just bandage that shit and it'll be fine. And I learned that you can set fire to a shark underwater. One out of five sharks. It's fucking dreadful. Thank you for watching Reviews in a Rabbit Onesie. I've been Dan Leith. This has been Benchley, my main shark. Stay safe, stay sane. Um, just accept the fact that beaches are closed. Finn. Thank you to Dan for sending in his uh, rabbit re reviews in a rabbit onesie. One day I'll get that exactly right. I'm yeah. sorry, Dan. Um, if you haven't already um, checked out his um, PayPal, please do. It's paypal.me slash Dan uh, to give him a bit of support. Um, his video will be up on YouTube and Facebook later on as a standalone, uh, as well as um, Instagram and all the places we could possibly put it for Dan. Thank you very much. So. Uh, going to welcome now Brona, who's been uh, on the call from the beginning, but Hello. we haven't been able to talk to you yet because uh, yeah. we're rushing through uh, um, with Keelan. So thank you so much for joining us, Brona, uh, from the, the Lyric. Brona, is your title now producer or more specific? No, still producer. Producer, yeah. brilliant. I know. That's what, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Tommy, uh, who's directly above me on the little box. Tommy, I'm going to throw it over to you. So Brona, who's now producer at the Lyric, we were yeah. together. And we were. We were, yeah. So yep. what, what I think I'm interested in, in, in and I think other people would be interested in is what was your route then from obviously doing a drama degree at university and then ending up as producer at the Lyric? Because there was, uh, did you use a stage one program as well in there somewhere? 
Yeah. So I suppose like whenever we were at Queen's, which seems a million years ago, um, I didn't even know really what a producer's role was. Um, I kind of came into drama Queen's kind of not knowing that I wanted to do work in the arts, um, but not exactly knowing what I wanted to do. Um, so kind of dipped into acting, stage managing, you know, and kind of trying to see what I wanted to do. And it wasn't, I still left and graduated uni, not really fully knowing what I wanted to do, but knowing that I love theatre. And that I want to do, do anything I could to work in it. Um, so I we I decided to take a year out um, and travel to New Zealand and worked with a few theatre companies over there and was able to get experience working with um, an independent producer and working with directly theatre companies that had that role as producer because whenever we were kind of doing shows here, um, everybody, you know, there wasn't a direct producer. It was, direct, you know, the director, everybody was just mucking in. Yeah. doing what they can to get the show up um and it was just so intriguing and I loved the role of the producer that you were able to take all of you know the stress off the creatives and be able to kind of focus in do the organizing and be able to really really help the production come to life and be able to program as well which was something you know even choosing a show reading the script picking the team you know that was something to me that I was like well that's my dream job so whenever I came home did the same thing kind of wanted to make my own show worked on a couple of you know um profit chair shows and then whenever the stage one um role came up I just thought that that's the perfect opportunity because I had enough experience working as a producer but I still wanted to learn exactly you know it is a craft in itself and it was at the lyrics so threw me hat in and got it and it's just kind of the training that I got through stage one and at the lyric kind of built up that platform for me to be able to actually realize that the role in the lyric as a for a producer was really really important and kind of develop that role then and the assistant producer um and the producing role that it, it is now um because mm -hmm. there actually wasn't a producing role in the lyric obviously you had the executive producer which was jimmy but you know there was ad admin manager and kind of just fell through the cracks whereas the producer role really needed kind of developed and honed so that's it's an interesting. It's, it's an interesting thing that I've I've found this a lot, and obviously, like from drama schools as well, there is a slight disconnect between doing these courses and these trainings, and then actually sort of getting yourself into the industry. And um, it's it's interesting that it does take. So with the stage one program is that sort of directly for people coming out of university the one experience. Yeah, so stage one is um, basically a charity from UK Theatre and SALT. And they basically have created stage one as training commercial producers. So it is that they want to build up a the producers that they are financially aware, but also artistically driven. So you're not kind of, you're obviously wanting to create shows, but you do realise, and you, we know everybody, you know, that you do need to get the audiences in. Um, so a lot of the training was to do with um, to setting up a business, essentially, um, and being able to kind of ask the advice, know where to go, marketing, you know, it kind of covered all bases um, and really having a business head as well on you, as well as um, an artistic one. So that was the main kind of things that I was able to learn and be able to kind of take the space to to read and see shows, you know, it's the most important thing is just seeing shows, keeping up to date with what the industry needs. Did you find that difficult to go from kind of like this more kind of creative approach to um, sort of budgeting side of things and kind of more planning? And Yeah, I mean, it's so easy to not do the, I find it easier not to do the creative stuff because you kind of feel like you're on emails, you get distracted by you know budgets by spreadsheets um and you really need to carve out that time and make sure that that's important um that you are doing your reading and that you are watching your shows and reading your reviews and you know talking to people talking to creatives talking to directors actors um and that is as equally as important as the spreadsheets as well so mm -hmm. but it is hard it is hard to get the valve sometimes whenever there's a fund and application gm and there's more deadlines on that um so yeah you just need to be you just need to be kind of really but then it's the fun like the creativity is the fun part um, and yeah. so it's always nice Do you, was it intimidating to go from um something like that obviously being from northern ireland the lyric is sort of a bit of an institution here 
And do you think that it was, was it more of a challenge to go in there and start producing work with them or did you, did you kind of adapt to that quite easily? No, definitely it was hard. Um, like, well, it wasn't hard because everybody was so great and lovely. Um, and I kind of took that year as my development um, as well as working, which was really, really good. Um, I didn't kind of go in and go, okay, this is the program I want to do. And I wouldn't do it that way. I want to do it this way. Um, so I kind of took a few, a couple of months actually, and just learning and the structure of within the lyric and learning, you know, people's roles and what the kind of the dynamic in the building was and kind of seeing where then I could fit in and also where I could improve and kind of see the gaps and also seeing like where the program, what I kind of wanted to do because you're meant to be, I did say Jimmy and Claire and that, like, you know, this is, what I would want to be doing um, and making sure that artistically that you know me and Jimmy were on the same page because that's equally as important is that kind of working relationship um, which I think you know we have a good and bad day mostly good <laughs> but... <laughs> are, you, are you tell them they can't have money for something <laughs> exactly <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting I was reading something yesterday about um, uh, someone that I know who has had an experience of assistant directing and kind of ending up in this professional capacity uh, and not really understanding kind of what the role uh, needed or what was expected of them. And I find that mm-hmm. with uh, sort of certain roles in theatre where there's kind of not really a set um, kind of job outline and things like that. Like when you arrived at the Lyric, was there certain conventions or things that you hadn't experienced before or certain things that you kind of thought you would be doing that you didn't end up doing? It was someone else's responsibility. Yeah, um, I think that there was quite a bit of that in terms of, you know, obviously you knew what the job description was that you were going into, but with producing, it's a weird one. You're kind of across lots of different departments. So, you know, you need to work with the marketing team as soon as you come up with the title that you want to produce mm. and, you know, pick your creative team. So you're already dealing with the, the personalities of the creative team, as well as then getting the marketing team to work with the creative team to create the director's vision um, for them to market it, for them to talk to each other. Um, and then within the production team, it's then, you know, making sure that the CSM, DSM, production manager, that they're all speaking to the creative team. And, you know, it was mostly the thing that I found was communication was like the the main majority part. Of, it was my job was to make sure that everybody was speaking to each other. And like, you know, yes, you can speak to each other, but it, are you getting the right information from that person that you need um, to make it successful was like the, the key thing that I learned. Um, and was kind of invaluable to the job was not just making sure that everyone everyone obviously did and you know but I kind of felt like that you know it was making sure that everyone was on the same page was the biggest challenge I suppose that I wasn't expecting to, that I needed to do I kind of um, which was really really interesting yeah. if that makes sense and sure as well it's, yeah. it's easy here in, in Northern Ireland you know, everyone's quite supportive of each other and kind of you can I'm sure in other places it would be a lot harder to kind of come in and sort of adapt things and and get start working with people that obviously been there a long time and haven't had the role before. Mm-hmm. In theater. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, like people don't like change, I suppose, as well. Um, so the fact that it wasn't a new role, but you know, it's just kind of was being respectful to the people who were there and getting the knowledge and kind of gaining that respect from them as well. Yeah. What were some of the challenges? So. Obviously, you guys were working on the new speak thing that sort of was going along with the new season and that all had to go online at the last minute. Was there any particular things that you, um, obviously it was quite different probably, I'd assume, than what you'd done before, but what were the particular challenges of kind of adapting to that new new normal, I guess? Yeah, I mean, whenever we decided to put new speak online, um, it was a big choice that I didn't want to make for the team. I definitely just put it to the artists and said, do you feel like you can create the same impact of your work that you would want to? And that's that you're not kind of at a disadvantage, obviously from it being online and that you can deliver something that you'd be proud of. So um, definitely that was a big discussion and, you know, they just decided to run with it, which was amazing. Um, So the challenges was definitely, we wanted to create something of quality um, that was, you know, to have the lyrics name on it. And we wanted them to feel supported, that they are able to do it safely um, and that everybody's health and well-being is at the forefront um, because obviously it was at the very start of the lockdown. So, you know, everyone was kind of up to high as it was. So we didn't want to put any extra pressure on people. So 
So it was really making sure that we were able to create a safe environment for them to create work, um, which our production manager, Adrian, did an amazing job as well um, of just, you know, working with them and, you know, Oshin and Emily, the directors, you know, doing the rehearsals over Zoom. He kind of got the equipment, disinfected it all down, delivered it safely outside, you know, making sure that everything was being done, you know, as safely as possible. Um, so I think that that was the biggest challenge was making sure that we weren't kind of pushing people out of their comfort zones during this um, and making sure that we were able to create something that was worthy to be on the, you know, the lyrics YouTube page and that we were able to as well do something that the artists were proud of and that they could create art during this time, which was amazing because they all decided to kind of, well, a few of them picked different things because what they had decided to do had changed within a day, two days. Um, and they felt empowered to create something new and that was relevant and responsive to now, even though that was the brief, say, two weeks ago that had changed already. So they really ran with it. And, you know, and yeah, it's it kind of gone from strength to strength each week. Yeah, it, is, it was uh, actually, so sorry on, to interrupt, yeah. Tony, but I just had to say it was brilliant. It was really, really brilliant to see something that was responding to the situation. So, mm -hmm. like, with such a current. The content was so current. the The response to it was, you, you know, using mediums that we we that we have at hand, and it was just everything was just so on point. Like, it 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 really, it's really hard to imagine what they were thinking on doing before that. Do you know what I mean? Because it was yeah. such, it was such a response, such a quick response, and like congratulations on it. It's been brilliant. I've like really really been laughing Thank at you. it. But the other thing yeah. we we talked before we started here about resilience and just looking at that there that is something that as theater and theater we have to be resilient and we have to respond quickly and that's that's what we're expected to do um what like going forward do you think is this what what came out of the the response to the COVID? do you think is that something going forward that you would continue to pursue or do you want to just go straight back to the way well, that's the thing. I don't think we will be going straight back, um, you know, and with, you know, all the challenges that comes opportunities. So you kind of have to run with it and create something, create an environment and um, a landscape that you you need to be responsive to what you can do. Um, so we're definitely, I think I'll be easing back into what, what we, I don't know if we'll go back to normal, but um yeah just kind of having that in between you know if say you know the theatres are opening in the south in August you know what's social distancing so how does that look for us is that you know reduced capacity how do you rehearse a show if a cast member goes down they all need to self-isolate for two weeks um you know rehearsal periods only four weeks the turnaround for theatre is just so quick um that you know we have to come up with these creative solutions but it's definitely coming up with the those creative solutions is going to be what we're doing over the next um couple of months um but yeah re the resilience thing i think that the arts have been resilient for forever you know like we're constantly being resilient so um and the funny thing is i think people will be looking at this sector to see what how they are responding um because we are creative thinkers so yeah it's definitely something that we're at, is at the forefront of how we keep our doors open and you know and making sure that we have the doors open for whenever we can open them i suppose even this this medium that accidental theater are doing it's just mm -hmm. like and it was how quickly and how rapidly it was it, like it it was turned out as you say it's like people will be looking towards the arts again for for the kind of rapid response that we have but it's just then as Caitlin was saying earlier he's trying to get the funding to support the artists to do that as well exactly no that's the most important thing is making sure that it's supported properly so Feels like a bit of a double-sided coin. Um, obviously, the Republic have announced about uh, op opening the theatres again in sort of August time, and it's sort of like we can kind of get an idea of of what they might do and what that might look like. But then we don't know yet about how it's going to look for us and if it's going to be different or if we're going to. So it's sort of like you can, there's kind of a bit of an optimism, but also a bit of frustration because if if they're opening in August and we're still being told that it's going to be longer and stuff, it's it's difficult, but it gives us time to kind of look at what they're doing, see how they're doing safely and almost like a test run in a way. Yeah, of course. And that's the thing. I think with theatres, you know, yes, with 
bars and museums, you know, you can you can put in the social distancing measures and but are able to open for producing theatre. You know, you but you need to rehearse, you need to have your tech week, you know, you can't just open unless you have a visiting company that's ready to go. But even at that, that producer of that visiting company needs to have done its work before. So, you know, it's kind of seeing what is realistic for people to do and do it safely um, is a real challenge in terms of what we're scenario planning for at the moment. Um, it's it's the time yeah. to start to, you know, do a lot of hospital dramas in the Lyric. You know, everyone's already <laughs> in gowns and masks. It'd be perfect. And I'm kind of thinking like a post-apocalyptic thing where they're all in those big, like, you know, gas masks <laughs> and everything. Definitely. <laughs> Won't be too on the nose. But, you know, Fury, <laughs> Fury Road Lyric Edition would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> I'm checking that one. <laughs> it's yours. Thanks. You were talking earlier about about traveling, and uh, obviously, you're a very proud dairy woman. Do you get to yeah. go back, much work back home, or is is that is there sort of like people you would always go back and see their work, or anything uh, sort of on the more regional side of things? Definitely. Um, I mean, like I'm a massive um, fan of the Playhouse in Derry. I think that you know that's where me and Gary Crossan. Shout out to Gary um, for just our, you know, first show was over a summer in university um, and we were back home in Derry and just really like going, you know, we, we were just craving to create something. Um, so we kind of approached them and said, can we put on the History Boys for two nights in August? Um, so we kind of got together and auditioned and rehearsed and, you know, that was kind of the first show that we produced and they were so supportive that we were just like, yeah, go for it. Um, on your head, bait kind of thing. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we sold out two nights in the Playhouse and that was just like the biggest buzz I think that I've ever had was, you know, kind of we had a budget of like was like 400 pounds or something. And, you know, everybody just kind of did it. You know, we had 12 fellows that wanted to just rehearse over summer and, you know, create theatre. So that was that was amazing. And they kind of gave us the first kind of left indie professional theatre, you know, that we wanted to keep going and keep doing it. That's great. Is there any other theatres sort of um, nationwide that you think is producing really good work at the moment? Um, definitely, like Sheffield theatres, I think are knocking it out of the park. Um, they they are they're doing amazing work. Um, they're you know they've kind of got the regional theatre of the year a few times. Then I've been over to see what they're doing because they kind of ha I think that they have a good program of mixing um, commercial. Obviously, they're a massive bigger scale, but they really you know kind of develop and commission um their own work as well like they the way they were the they commissioned the everybody's talking about jamie the big west end hit musical and but they and I, and I love that i love and that's what i love about the lyric is that we commission work and you know we we're, we're where it starts you know we just don't kind of yes we left stuff off the shelf sometimes but we do commission artists as well um and obviously they are they like we're, i'm always a massive fan of them as well so you find there's a, there's a lot of like sort of um, especially with the lyric and the Abbey is like the co-production side of things. Do you think that that's going to keep sort of increasing going going forward as people look to other ways where they can fund bigger shows and sort of bring shows to more more places, do more tours and things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like the, I think that's a massive part of it. Um, you know, both financially and for audiences, and kind of especially for the lyric to be able to have you know such a good relationship with the Abbey that we're, we can go down there and show our work. Um, so, you know, we were already even with good vibrations and we had to cancel it. But, you know, the fact that we were going to be on there for three weeks um, and it was a Belfast story, you know, had such a Northern Irish kind of um, theme on it. And, you know, and that was just really exciting for us to do. And then other ones like Double Cross, which is our co-pro in the Norton, was like a classic that we were able to you know, share the cost of because it was a bit more of a risk but also you're kind of sharing your audiences. So I think that those relationships are really important and they are different audiences as well. So it's finding that balance that'll work for the two venues as well. Um, but I think, it's, yeah, it's really, really important. That's great. Um, well, so is there any other questions from... Uh... Yeah, there was. It's from Sean O'Connell again. This So this is from his students at St. Kevin's College in Fermanagh. And... His students asks, um, in relation to the, the, how important is marketing for a performing arts venue? And in Brona's experience, what forms of marketing work best? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that marketing um, has one of the hardest jobs because it seems that marketing marketing's budget's always cut for some reason. Whenever funding doesn't come through, people just automatically cut their marketing, which I think is always crazy because you need a really strong marketing campaign to get the audiences through the door and the bums and seats. So um, I think that the best marketing that we've kind of be, well audience development is social and digital marketing at the minute and uh, you know are having a really strong brand i know that sounds really kind of corporate but i think yeah. that it is important um that you have a poster that if you are producing lots of shows that you know when you look you're like that's a lyric show you know that's really clear really clean it tells you exactly what it's going to be um and that is eye catching that you you know so a poster image is like the main thing that you can kind of put out on social put out on digital and then if you do put it out on outdoor billboards that people recognize it and know actually if i've seen that a few times like why am i keep saying that you know what's the buzz around it um i think is really important and it looks exciting and cool but it's not messy and i hate yeah. you know like there's not loads going on but you you kind of see you know the tone of the show from it yeah i guess kind of the identity of the of the venue as well yeah, yeah exactly yeah it's really interesting. I always that, hated that word brand. I was like a brand. Oh, yeah. that's really. But it is true. You do. You do need it. I think like there is that tension between like you know the corporate stuff and like the creative stuff. But like it's like you said earlier, like you have to do the spreadsheets. Like the better you are at that sort of, um, at that stuff, the more people you reach, and mm -hmm. you know, you know, ultimately you're reaching more people and bringing art to people. So that's a great answer. Yeah. Thanks very much, and thanks uh, Sean O'Connell for sending those in. Yes, thank you. Do you find that, that identity as well? Do you have discussions about that when you're thinking about what shows you want to produce or what shows you want in the next season? Is there a certain like lyric identity that you consider as well? Like what kind of shows you want to produce moving forward and what you want to build that kind of identity to be? A hundred percent. Yeah, like that, that's kind of at the forefront of the conversations is, you know, is this a show that, you know, we want to produce and that audience will want to see and that we're going to be able to employ artists to do like a good job on it. Um, so definitely, you know, it's it's at the forefront of it is why are we producing this? Should we be? Um, because obviously, you know, we're not going to be at the Lyric forever. So we need to kind of make sure that the mission and values of the Lyric are being fulfilled through the programme. Um, you know, so if that's a classic, if it's a new play um, or, you know, if it's like a revival of something you know it needs to have a purpose that needs to have you know you need to you need to know why you're doing it and why you want to produce it and how that then fits under the overall program of that season um and you know if that all kind of gels together it's kind of like a jigsaw um putting things together and looking at them because we have two seasons kind of like spring summer and then autumn winter um so you kind of have to look at the full year but also then kind of get down to the nitty-gritty of you know the the season that you're working on and you know that you're not doing two comedies back to back or you're not doing like a really like two really serious plays back to back and you know making sure that that jigsaw fits them together yeah it might be too early but is there do you think there'll be a lot of discussions about how that might look going forward now because of everything that's happening right now and how that changes things yeah i mean like for us it's kind of knowing the state of the nation after this um and knowing what people want to see um, because you have to be sensitive to, you know, how the public are feeling as well um, and what kind of art, obviously, like, you, you don't want to kind of withhold what art people want to see, but also you do have to be kind of thinking, well, you know, will people want to go and see a really hilarious comedy or, you know, um, will somebody want to go and see a play about the end of the world, which was what one of our commissions was about. So I was like, oh. Um, so, you know, you do have to be kind of considerate um, from that as well. But also I, wanting to do the program that you had in the back of your head, you know, so that you're not kind of letting loads of people down. Yeah, I was working, I was sort of uh, working with a director and writer um, to be in a, a film that he was producing, and it was sort of a kind of apocalyptic thing before this happened. And then it was sort of like sent us an email, it's like, still going to happen, but it might be slightly different. It's that yeah. kind of thing. That do you lean into it and sort of go with kind of exploring this sort of current thing or do you kind of go the opposite way and kind of avoid sort of um again like we mentioned before sort of like dwelling on it and kind of uh i guess depressing people in a way is the risk of sort of like just keep going over and over and over about how terrible everything is 
Yeah, exactly. I know, and you want to kind of inspire people too. And that's what kind of theatre is about, doesn't it? It's like making conversation and creating that. So if people's going to see something that you've seen a million times or, you know, that you're already talking about, you kind of want to, you know, get people talking. Yeah. Yeah. What's, um, do you have like a, a one moment that sticks out as like a, your proudest moment when like a show that you produced that was really, that you thought did really well or kind of exceeded your expectations or even something that was like uh, something that you find really challenging that you're able to overcome and, and to keep going in that light of inspiring people? <laughs> I've got so many <laughs> of challenging times. Uh, no, I think that um, there's been so many. I like, you know, I'm, I'm always part of what kind of the shows that I, you know, what they put out. Um, I think there, there's probably two that is like coming straight to mind was um, Good Vibrations because that was kind of the first real big musical um, that I had produced um, that was of that um, scale with you know actor musicians and there was a new script well obviously it was adapted from the film but there were so many unknowns um, for me and it was such a big cast cast and such you know a big kind of um, the biggest budget that I had worked on um, so making sure that that was a good job I definitely felt the pressure and, and then a few kind of hiccups that happened you know along the way but by the time you know the preview had went up I was just like buzzing that we had a show on that stage you know and that it was really really kind of of the scale that it was um that yeah so that was kind of one and then probably Shirley Valentine um because obviously um Julie Lewis had passed away during that um and just seeing the fact that you know Tarlan O'Neill and the team had had it that decided to go and create still create the show um so that first preview and that first show was just really like inspiring to me as to you know that we're talking about resilience and yeah. um passion you know that that was there and they and they you know pulled it out of the bag and still you know went ahead um was really inspiring for me that's great um, around that time as well it was it became very apparent that in northern ireland we're a very very close community Mm-hmm. And the support that was there um, for people at that time was absolutely incredible. And again, mm-hmm. the Lyric had were very commendable in how they reacted to it as well. But um, in terms of going forward with this, whenever things go back to normal, we don't know. Like, do you see this? Do you see everything we'd said before about what is normal going to be? But like, do you think, have we is this going to unify everybody in terms of how we're going to respond or do you think it, it's going to separate everybody out? No. I mean, I think it has to unify people. Um, I think that, you know, live theatre is in that unique um, category that people go for the experience of, a, you know, a communal experience because they want to be together. Um, and I think that that's really important with theatre is that like, you know, everybody wants to be in the same room. And at the minute we can't do that. Um, and I, you know, and I, you can tell that people are just dying to get back to that. Um, so I do feel like, you know, people will want to come back and gravitate towards like, you know, theatre is one of the oldest art forms that we have. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Um, so I think that, you know, people just kind of have to stick by their guns and, you know, kind of, and keep the head up as they say, and just kind of, you know, wait for this to be over, but also be in a state that we're able to, you know, be able to still create for people whenever they come back, because the audiences will be there, I think. Um, I think that they might be shying away, you know, now because of what's, the, you know, is out there. But I definitely think that, you know, yeah, come what, maybe next year, but or in a few months, you know, like, yeah, I think that there will be, you know, the audience will be there for it. You see that a bit, I think, with all the live streaming stuff, like the, particularly the national theatre stuff, the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people that tune in just for like, like you can watch a film or whatever, you can watch Netflix at home, but just that sort of get close to that experience of being mm-hmm. in actual theatre with a live audience is, is still like obviously a huge, yeah. huge difference. Yeah, with actual actors and people, you know, yeah. on the stage, like, you know, there's just, there's just nothing like it. And that's why people keep coming. Yeah. As well as that, it's actually opened everything up. Like I'm from Donegal, so as I say, we've been isolated since 1910, so it didn't make any difference. <laughs> but um, in terms of getting into the same room with a director or getting into, it's just getting everybody into the same Zoom now. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, so many barriers have been broken down by. I'm exactly. But 
there is that even like this like there's so many people from different theater companies and different walks of life that can that will go into these types of meetings and things like that in a way it's kind of opened up a lot of stuff definitely i think you're dead right with that one you know it's weird because all of a sudden you are able to have you know the world is a smaller place um, you know, that you're you're able to kind of reach these people and kind of keep the conversations going um, for whenever you are doing it. So, yeah, it is. It's weird in that way. Like, I've FaceTimed my friend in Canada way more than I would have. <laughs> like, it's really weird as if, like, I could have done that before. But, you know, I think that that's, that's another thing is that, you know, you kind of are able, you know, people always find a way, you know, to communicate with each other. So, yeah, I think you're dead right. Mm-hmm. That's great. Now, is there any more questions? Or um, I don't think so. Um, but thank you so much, Rona. That was excellent, even for uh, just as someone who's quite new to the world of theatre. That was really interesting. Um, so thank you very much. Thank, yeah, thank you, you so very much, much for having me. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, we are going to throw it now to Marty. Uh, Marty has made a fantastic video. Uh, he's been making lots of fantastic videos about how he makes his, his work. We haven't got to feature Marty as our house DJ for the chat show uh, yet today much. Um, so we're going to end today uh, with uh, Marty's making a track from, I think, the 6th of May, Marty. Uh, do you want to tell us anything as we, as we set it up? 6th of May. Oh, yeah. So this was last night. Um, <laughs> yeah. so... <laughs> I could have said last night, but I don't know what day it is anymore. I, know, exactly. uh, I, I need to maybe use that. Was that like that? There's a, uh, a segment in the States soon. now on some news programs. Is, yes, it's Thursday today. Um, <laughs> I, like because people have lost the plot of the what day is what. Totally. We should do that. Yeah. We'll start the show now with it's Thursday. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering where you are. Yeah. I... This adds a bit. So yeah, this was one of these things I've always wanted to do, and I've seen loads of people do, and I've never been able to do it myself. But it's this thing, this sort of, there's a bit of a sort of fad of musicians making songs uh, in one take, where they kind of like you know play everything in one go, and you sort of set up each instrument and build a song in real time and loop it and stuff like that, using like loopers to um put everything put everything together so i did i had a go at it and it was an absolute nightmare i have to admit it, it honestly like i think i have several more white hairs from the stress of doing this like because it was like about 30 takes of just <laughs> like trying to play each bit then switch to another instrument then switch to another instrument and play each bit and then if you make one mistake it's like start all over again so it was interesting like um i'll probably not be doing too many of these but yeah <laughs> that's that's what this ended up being but it turned out i think it turned out pretty well um so i'm like playing three different guitars and programming the drums and playing keyboards playing ukulele singing uh something else some effects and stuff as well some sort of electronic key bits as well so yeah it was quite intense <laughs> brilliant Okay, well, thank you so much to uh, Keenan for coming on. Thank you so much to Brona for coming on. Thank you for our, our uh, Little Heads panel of Tommy, yes. Louise, uh, Niall and Marty. Uh, if you want to come on, you want to be on the panel, you want to be uh, interviewed, please get in touch. You just have to email us at info at accidentaltheatre.co.uk or get in touch through the social channels that we've all been mentioning all day um, as, as the important marketing tool that it is. Um, please, please give us a subscribe or a follow on those said marketing channels uh, as it really helps up, uh, helps our site as it builds the whole community around uh, the work that we're doing. It's very, very helpful. Um, if you want to donate, please donate to uh, paypal.me slash Dan Leith or paypal.me slash Sadfa for Marty. Um, but we'll put that wee graphic up now before uh, we go we go forward. Or, hey, if you want to donate to us, because uh, we have no money, uh, as Kevin as says, uh, the, 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 the application to support theatres doesn't open until next week and we have no idea how to do it. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, uh, donate at accidentaltheatre.co.uk slash donate. Thank you so much. Uh, Marty, over to you to play us out. Virtual Marty, uh, who's the other virtual Marty. Uh, here we go to play us out from the 6th of May, his video uh, about making a song in one go.